Today is the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, a great feast in the church of these two noble and ennobling apostles of the Lord. In today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, we see Peter chained up under heavy guard. And an angel comes to him and sets him free. The powers of this world have always been trying to chain up the church, chain up, more poignantly, the very word of God itself. But the word of God cannot be chained. Peter was delivered by the prayers of the church for him. And so we pray for the church leaders today in general and for the Pope in particular. And the church leaders pray for the believing community in turn. A mutual prayer society that strengthens all of us. St. Paul would be chained up often in the course of his ministry but in one of his pastoral letters, he said, De verbum non allegatum. I like quoting Latin once in a while because I had six years of it in school, and I figure, why let it go to waste? <laughs> the word of God will not be chained, can't be chained. It's like a wildfire that spreads in all directions. And these two apostles were fire bugs in that sense. A fire that would give warmth, a fire that would give light, a fire that would give the humanity the capacity to be set free from the coldness and the darkness of sin. Now Peter and Paul worked together. And the successor of Peter, Pope Benedict XVI, has called for a very special jubilee year in order to honor St. Paul. And that year begins today and will go all the way until the 29th of June of next year. Benedict wants people to study Paul, to think about Paul, parishes to have discussion groups about Paul and individuals that come to know Paul better. And beyond that, to actually love St. Paul, because he's respected, admired, and studied all the time. But he needs to be loved. Now we know as Catholics, our journey of faith is not a lonely one. We not only have one another, but we have the angels and saints in heaven. And some saints are wildly popular with us. St. Anthony, for example, whom we have a statue to at our wayside shrine, is well known for helping us with the nitty-gritty of life. He has a whole lost and found apartment. <laughs> I mean, he's helped me find my keys about three or four times a week. And it all... <laughs> Naturally, we love that saint for that. <laughs> but what would we get from saying, St. Paul, pray for us. What does St. Paul do for us and want to do for us? Well, we can find the answer to that by looking at how he prayed for the believing community of the first century when he was here on earth. In all of his letters, he talks about praying for the recipients of the letters. First of all, he would pray that people would have faith, an understanding of God. And we need faith. So when we say, St. Paul, pray for us, our faith could be deepened. Then he would pray for people that they would have inner strength. To be a disciple of the Lord in the 21st century, we need three bones. First, we need a backbone. We need courage. We need strength. Secondly, we need a wishbone. We have the wish for a better world, hope, for a better situation for our friends, family, and loved ones. And finally, we need a funny bone in order to laugh at all of the things that go on in life and to drive away despair. Well, when we pray to St. Paul, 
We'll have that inner strength. And we'll also have a sense of joy. Over and over, he would pray for the Philippians, the Corinthians, the Romans. I pray that you have joy. Joy is so important in a life that is filled with so much heartbreak and sorrow. So when we say, St. Paul, pray for us, joy could fill our minds and hearts. When I go to New York City, which I do as often as I can, and ride the subways, which I like to do, and look around at the people on the subways, they're in one of the greatest cities in the world, one of the greatest cities in all the history of the world, and when I look at them, they're a blank face. No one looks at anyone else. Everyone tries to look as neutral as possible. You would think that there would be an ongoing national tragedy that everybody was grieving about. Where was the joy of being in this great metropolitan city? Certainly the joy that fills me when I'm walking down those sidewalks of New York and feel the concrete under my feet there and see all the activity, the arts, the people, the commerce. It really energizes a person, but it's not reflected. But when we pray to St. Paul, we can have joy of knowing that God loves us and we're a part of the eternal Jerusalem much greater than any earthly metropolitan area. What else do we get when we pray? St. Paul, pray for us. We have hope. We have courage. We have joy. But perhaps most of all, we can gain love. Everyone is always looking for love, but generally looking for love in all the wrong places, as one pop song once said. When we pray, St. Paul, pray for us, we could be filled with a sense of love and how to love. The phrase today, I love you, has been pretty well dissipated into something either rather romantically sappy or just really devoid of any real meaning. To say I love you in many cases is about the same as saying, I love vanilla ice cream. You know, both on the same level. But when we say, St. Paul, pray for us, what type of love could we gain? We could gain the type of love that he describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A love that is first of all kind. A love that is patience. A love that's able to endure all things. A love that's not phony, doesn't put on airs, isn't filled with pretense. A love that begins in this world and ends in eternity before the throne of the God of love. So when we say, St. Paul, pray for us, and we're asking for love, we will get love, a real love, a substantial love, a love that knows no boundaries and has no end. The next thing that happens when we say St. Paul pray for us, it makes us aware that we're a part of a community of faith. He was not a lone eagle. He would always have companions with him on his missionary journeys and he would be supported by the local missionary, the local Christian communities who loved him for his love of the Lord and his love for them. This type of love is so important. And this is what we share when we come together again, Sunday after Sunday, week after week, year after year. It's true, we can and should pray at home, in our rooms, privately with ourselves. But that's sort of a selfish spirituality. We need it. But by coming together, we support one another in prayer, in love, in happiness, in joy. And so Paul would always be praying in the midst of the believing community and for the believing community. And he would be urging them to participate in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ so that the believing community could become a part of the very body of Christ on earth. So when we say, St. Paul, pray for us, it's something powerful indeed. 
and we should become more and more like St. Paul in our attitude towards our fellow believers, our attitude towards humanity, and our connection with God. Now when we read through his letters, as I urge you to do in this year of Paul, get the old dusty Bible off the shelf, say, boy, I never really opened this before, <laughs> and go to any of his letters. Read a few passages a day, some of the short letters like the Thessalonians or Timothy or Titus. You can read in 15 minutes. And just think about them. Look at them as letters from an old family friend that's filled with wisdom that could teach us what it means to be a man, teach us what it means to be a woman, teach us what it means to be a child of God. And in it you'll see the connections Paul had with concrete people. You'll find out how he worked with women like Priscilla to spread the good news of Jesus. Or how he accepted the charity of Lydia, a successful businesswoman, a retailer of purple dyed cloth in the Acts of the Apostles. You'll see how he related to slaves and freemen alike poor and rich, but always talking about Jesus crucified and resurrected. A powerful understanding of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. As your reflections on St. Paul continue, you'll see that he was steeped in the word of God, the Hebrew scriptures. He had been a Pharisee, a rabbi, but a Pharisee and rabbi who was a blue-collar type of guy, as almost all Pharisees were. They were tended to be tradesmen, carpenters, workers, farmers. But their richness came from their knowledge of God's word in the Torah. And St. Paul himself was a tent maker. He used his trade throughout his life to try to support himself so he wouldn't impose on anyone. But he would ask for a collection. He wasn't afraid to pass the plate for the poor people of the world, and especially the poor of Jerusalem. And so if you want to be like St. Paul alive in your own life, you have to think of your family, friends, and relatives, community, parish, but humanity as a whole. And perhaps as part of this Pauline year, you could see ways that you could better support the, church, the poor through Catholic Charities, through the St. Vincent de Paul Society, through the Knights of Columbus, through all types of organizations, but through your own charitable activity as well. So when you say, St. Paul, pray for us, it could be a dangerous thing because it disturbs our complacency and it fills us with a burning desire to love more and more people in more and more ways. And on this feast day that begins the year of Paul, that is my prayer for you. That when the year is over, you'll be more holy, more loving, more humble, and more alive than you've ever been in your life.